This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce somebody who really doesn't need much of an introduction to this crowd. Um, uh, Lucia Carbone what? is our uh, Roman it. specialist. She is curator of Roman I coins. I the soft soap, but I'll get it at the uh, uh, chair. Uh, here at the American Numismatic Society, and she's going to be giving today part two of her uh, um, presentation on portraits of women on Roman Republican and Imperial coins. And in fact, uh, one thing I, I do want to do is do a little plug for an upcoming ANS Lyceum. And in fact, uh, Lucia had proposed a topic for this fall's Lyceum on uh, women uh both in and on numismatics and so we're, we're still hammering out the details of that and we will be announcing that at some point uh, in the coming weeks but um just to let you know that uh, i think that we've settled on that topic for uh, the forthcoming lyceum uh, which will start i believe in october so uh keep uh, keep tuned to uh announcements for that and more than happy now to turn it over to, to lucia so Yes, I mean, uh, and I think this Lyceum will be really, really exciting because uh, I guess it will be longer than uh, usual because we will uh, we will go on, go begin in Greece and then go on up to the US uh, and medallic art. Uh, so, yes, I mean, I'm very, very happy about it. So, but let's begin then with the topic of the day. Thank you for being uh, still here um and let's begin exactly with cleopatra then um okay and here play from the start there you go so i will begin of course uh, uh now with cleopatra uh seventh the seventh and uh, um, what is very interesting about her is that the fact that Cleopatra clearly was a woman with a lot of agency, let's say. Uh, we know that now it's really um, pretty hot in, uh, modern, in contemporary scholarship to talk about women and agency, agency, of course, in politics, uh, agency on carnage, or, for example, for their own representation on portraits. There is no doubt whatsoever that Cleopatra the Seventh was very skilled at communication, and uh, contemp contemporary now scholarship uh, Alston uh, found out, found and clearly identified three different kind of portraits of Cleopatra of her life, in her life. And we will discuss them because we will see also the way in which this is also reflected on coinage. This one uh, that you see here, which is today at the British Museum, this is the most, let's say, bland in some way representation of Cleopatra as an Hellenistic queen. You recognize, of course, the Melon Frisur here and, uh, okay, the very long nose. But this is a pretty standard representation of youthful Cleopatra as an Hellenistic queen. But we will see several different representations of her one of which uh, is the one where she presents herself uh, as uh, a pharaoh, literally, uh, wearing the triple ureus. The ureus is the cobra snake. And Cleopatra VII was the one who created this triple ureus on her, uh, uh, on her um, crown. And we will discuss this. And then there is the hyper-realistic representation that we see on, uh, for example, the Roman Denari issued by Mark Antony, where she has these very masculine facial features, uh, which are clearly related to power. But we will talk more about this. So this is, for example, a um, representation of Cleopatra as an Egyptian queen, a pharaoh. And as you can see here, you see this triple Ureus here. 
Now, uh, usually uh, the normal crown was, of course, with two euros, which represented the upper and lower Egypt. Cleopatra the seventh is the first one, the first and the last, of course, of the Ptolemies, to add a triple, the third element to the crown, which. Uh, um, has been discussed, of course. There's been a lot of discussion in recent scholarship about what does this tribal Uris mean. Uh, but, um, I mean, several, uh, the, the last Alston and so, has become convinced that uh, this tribal Uris has to do with Rome and her relationship to Rome. So, in some way, even uh, in this, of course, imagine this representation of Cleopatra in this way was only for the Egyptians. This is important because, of course, she presented herself as an Hellenistic queen to everybody, to the people from Alexandria and everybody outside of Egypt. This one, this representation of herself was clearly only for an Egyptian audience where she represents herself as a queen in some way, a, a pharaoh, queen of Egypt, that also is bringing the power of Egypt well beyond, clearly, the boundaries of Egypt, in a way which has, was never done, had never been done until that point by any of the Ptolemies. That's why she revolutionized, literally, the crown she's wearing. Now, so Cleopatra, the first representation we have, I mean, we know Cleopatra was born in 69 BC. Her father, uh, Ptolemy Auletes, uh, had a lot of problem. Ptolemy the 12th Auletes, so let's say, had a little bit of problem, I would say a lot of problem, with the people from Alexandria because they expelled him and he was put back on his throne by Pompey. So literally, well before even, uh, uh, not well before Cleopatra was born, but when Cleopatra was just two, she had witnessed this. She had already been in Rome. She knew that Rome was an absolutely vital element for the survival of the Ptolemy, because this was exactly the position and which uh, her own father, Ptolemy Auletes, was. And uh, this that you see is, uh, um, this one I'm presenting here, is a coin, a very beautiful one, one of the first one issued by Cleopatra. Uh, we know that Cleopatra was uh, uh, put uh, on her throne. I mean, we know that when Caesar after Pharsalus came to Egypt in order to avenge, uh, avenge uh, Pompey, which had been, which had been killed, murdered, uh, murdered by the pharaoh, so one of the, uh, one of the uh, brothers of Cleopatra, um, she was put on the throne, basically, by Caesar. Of course, the meetings, the details of the meetings between uh, Cleopatra and Caesar have been discussed. Uh, of course, we have the story that Cleopatra was in this carpet, and uh, or but Plutarch talks about to, Plutarch talks about bed linens and so and so. But anyway, Cleopatra clearly was somebody who cared a lot about her image and once again about uh, the relationship with Rome that she cultivated immediately and also the famous, uh, the famous cruise along the Nile she took with Caesar uh, in 47 BC is, uh, of course, it's not only a lover trip, uh, but was really a way to present to Caesar, uh, present to Caesar the Egypt, but at the same time also to present to the Egyptian Rome, but in a way that would not be threatening to the Egyptians, really, and this sort of cooperation, like um, as Egypt, and this was already possibly in the mind of Cleopatra, 
Egypt and Rome are allied in the creation of a unified East. That's the idea. Anyway, you see this is a, um, a, a Diobol. A Diobol is one of the very best specimens we know of this Diobol, where you can recognize clearly the, um, uh, the uh, facial features, the portrait of Cleopatra. Of Cleopatra represented as an Hellenistic queen with a diadem. Okay, and this is uh, from the mint in Egypt of Alexandria, and these uh, uh, should be dated uh, should be dated to um, to exactly the year between the 50 and 40 BC. But um, what is incredibly interesting uh, is the fact that we know that Caesar bestowed on Cleopatra. Cyprus, which had been originally a part of the Ptolemaic kingdom. And uh, there on Cyprus, uh, Cleopatra issued a very, very interesting coin where she is represented here as Aphrodite with a little Ptolemy V, Caesar, called Caesarion, which was born right in 47 BC, so was a baby at that time. It's very important to remember that Ptolemy the 15th Caesar was the only biological son of Julius Caesar. And also we know that Julius Caesar brought Cleopatra back with him to Rome. And uh, so and we know that Cleopatra made a big splash, let's say, in Rome, also because Julius Caesar uh, put a statue of Cleopatra, a wooden statue plated in gold of, Cleop uh, in, of Cleopatra, in the important temple of Venus Genitrix. So, of course, uh, Venus, uh, Venus as a... Um, mother, a mother of the Julian, of the Julian, uh, of the Julian Gantz, so the, fam the Julian family. But what it is now known from uh, the portraits we have is that possibly Cleopatra, the statue of Cleopatra in, um, in, the, for in the, for uh, the forum of Julius Caesar, where the temple, actually inside the temple of Venus Genitrix, had Cupid on her shoulder. And I will show you how people came to this. But so, which means there is a direct dialogue from this coin issued in Cyprus and the statue that was put, uh, that was put and dedicated to Cleopatra in the temple of Venus Genitrix. So, once again, well before, and this is what I'm, try I'm trying to convey that well before Mark Antony, well before his fated or fated uh, and fateful uh, encounter than with Mark Antony, of course, possibly they knew each other, of course, now in 47 in Rome, but Cleopatra is already at the center, uh, at the center of Rome, of the imaginary of Rome, since Julius Caesar makes it pretty clear by putting a statue of her in the temple that was meant to commemorate her, um, his own gents, his own familia, uh, sorry, family, not familia, which is different. But, and once again, not only her, and that's the huge point that I'm trying to make here, here also, but the son she bore to Caesar which is Ptolemy the 15 Caesar, which is, by the way, the reason, the ultimate reason, the first and foremost reason why the first thing that Octavian after Actium, uh, Octavian after Actium made sure was killing Ptolemy the 15, Caesarion, first of all. 
I mean, <laughs> then afterwards they get cool, also killed the other children of Antony, or at least the oldest one. The other ones were spared. But this is why the, the reason is because Caesarion, Ptolemy the 15, Caesar, Caesarion as Cleopatra called him, was central, not only was the biological son of Caesar, but had been central since 47 BC in the imaginary of Rome, together with his mother. And this is a statue from Egypt that has been, um, has been identified as uh, Caesarion. Uh, you see here, it's very interesting. He has um, this uh, skirt, which is typical of the pharaohs with the belt here. But what is also super interesting, if you look at the hair of Caesarion, you see that the hair of Caesarion is very similar to the hair, for example, of Octavian. So it has this specific, uh, this specific haircut. So in order to highlight his double parentage, the fact that yes, he is a pharaoh because of her mother, but also he is a Julian, is part of the Julian family. And therefore he has, uh, as you see, he has claims to both, both Egypt and Rome. So just go on. And I just want to uh, show you that um, this is a, a very, very, very famous mosaic. This is the mosaic from Palestrina, um, the so-called Nilotic mosaic. So with a, um, it's really a, a genre, let's say, a genre of representations, with representation of the Nile. Now, um, there's been, once again, a lot of discussion about the dating of this incredibly beautiful uh, mosaic that is, still, uh, um, that is still in Palestrina, while its twin mosaic is now in Rome, in the Palazzo Massimo alle Terme. Uh, but now this is sort of universally dated to the years before Cleopatra. But until, let's say, two decades ago, it was said to be uh, to have been realized while Cleopatra was in Rome. One thing that is very important to, un to remember is that Cleopatra spent in Rome three years, from 47 to 44 BC. So when we talk about exactly what happens, so what Julius Caesar was doing, at the same time, it's very important to remember that Cleopatra was in Rome, parading around the child she had with Julius Caesar, the only biological child of Julius Caesar. And so important was she that, uh, and, and the Egyptian, and uh, um, so was she, that she literally introduced what is called an Egyptizing mode uh, fashion that was kept well alive under Augustus. And we have, for example, Augustus is the one that then consecrated a temple to Isis in the very center of Rome, which was the Campus Martius. They say Campense. But then now I'm going back to coins, but just I wanted to show you how much more there is. So how Cleopatra was already Cleopatra well before uh, meeting uh, Mark Antony. Okay. So of course, uh, we will now talk about the game-changing encounter between Cleopatra and Mark Antony in Tarsus uh, in Cilicia. But let's now uh, remember that by this time, Mark Antony, of course, uh, uh, Mark Antony is still married to Fulvia, who is at this time, I mean, to, going back to the long table last time, uh, Mark, uh, Fulvia is fighting, uh, is fighting uh, on behalf, supposedly in behalf of Mark Antony in Perugia, together with the brother of Mark Antony against Octavian. And Mark Antony is in the East, and he met with Cleopatra. Um, once again, this is a very, very attentively choreographed 
meeting where Cleopatra is, uh, presents herself uh, in this very beautiful description that you have. I, I'll not read it, you, you, are, you can read it uh, on your own, but there is this gilded barge where she is, uh, present, she presents herself as Aphrodite and remember that she had already presented herself as Aphrodite uh, for the last decade beginning in 47 BC on the coinage of Cyprus. So when she presents herself as Aphrodite, it's not something new. It's not like, I don't know, a Halloween idea for her own, of course, ante literam, but it's something that people immediately recognized her as Aphrodite. And of course, Aphrodite is also the um, Hellenistic, uh, Hellenistic version, let's say, the Hellenistic counterpart of Isis. And all uh, the queen of Egypt identified themselves as Isis. So once again, this is telling some, uh, something. And let's remember that Antony had also entered Ephesus the same year, presenting himself as Dionysus. So as uh, uh, Plutarch um, re reminds us, so this is a divine encounter, a divine meeting, which is choreographed for the Eastern people, because please, I mean, I'm sorry that exactly that's too weak from our first part, but if you remember the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, especially the Ptolemies, like to present themselves at, at divine couple, no? The Teoia Delphoi, or they present themselves as Isis and Serapis. So what Mark Antony and Cleopatra are presenting here, are choreographing here in Tarsus, is really for the benefit of the people of the East. And they are reproducing in their own way, in their own way, this divine couple, this divine, uh, this, uh, the divine uh, encounter between two deities that, of course, is supposed to bring prosperity to everyone. And this is exactly what Plutarch writes, that Venus had come to feast with Bacchus for the common good of Asia. So really, here, right from the beginning, both of them have a very clear idea seems though, of what is the way to talk to the people in the East. Because of course they have this blueprint uh, which were, had been provided by the Ptolemies. And also once again, Cleopatra had already been creating, creating for herself uh, since 47 BC, this idea of herself as Aphrodite and this idea that her power, the power of Rome, depends in some way from Egypt in the East, and the power of Egypt, of course, is tightly bound to the one of Rome. So I'll just go on. Of course, this is a beautiful uh, painting of Antony entering Ephesus as Bacchus, as uh, Dionysus. And here we have from, uh, I mean, um, the very, I mean, groundbreaking contribution to the coinage of Antony and uh, Cleopatra uh, have been done in the last uh, few years, actually, in the last uh, five years and so, by uh, Julien Olivier at the BNF, uh, that together with other co-authors uh, has uh, really thoroughly studied uh, the coinage of, um, of Antony and Cleopatra and put it uh, uh, and put it in correlation with the coinage of the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. So uh, this uh, uh, this map that I'm showing you is a map that is, as you see, uh, taken from uh, one of his contribution. And you can see here uh, in this uh, the map of the coinage. Uh, the, the coinages issued by Antony and Cleopatra together. Of course, we're going to talk about the, 
specific, specifically about each, not each, but several of these coinages. But I just would like to see, as you do notice, uh, that that there are several uh, several of uh, these. Uh, and for example, Ascalon, you have uh, you have several tether drums, for example, in, in Beritos and Ascalon, you have uh, and you have uh, tether drums that are issued just in the name of Cleopatra. But there are several other places, like for example, Dora Fenice, where uh, you have uh, portraits or, or calches where you have Jugate portraits of Antony and Cleopatra. And uh, for example, you have, of course, in Antioch uh, a, po a production of portraits of Antony and Cleopatra. But I will now show you the specificities, the stylistic specificities of these, uh, of these different kind of coinages and how this could relate to really a uh, an idea of power about this. And what is important uh, for us to uh, also remember is that all this area, in some way, uh, this, this area, this Phoenician, so, was put in some way under the prostasy, under the hegemony, let's say, of Egypt. So, of course, uh, Rome at, the sea, at, at Syria, there was a province there, but all this area was under direct or indirect Ptolemaic influence and rule. So, this, oh, sorry, this is a very rare tetradrum of Cleopatra uh, from uh, Ascalon. And uh, uh, so dated to 4140 BC, so right after this uh, fateful encounter in uh, Tarsus between Cleopatra and Mark Antony. And one thing is that you cannot see it, but here it's written anyway, Basilissas Cleopatras. So on this coinage, so of the Queen Cleopatra, so on this coinage in 4140 BC, Cleopatra has not taken for herself the the title that will be then very, very important for her starting in 37, which is Cleopatra Thea Neotera. And we will discuss what does this mean, of course, why, why this title is so important, what does it mean in correlation, of course, to their imperial, their imperial aspirations. And you have uh, here another, uh, another, this is uh, bronze, and you can see here Cleopatra again represented here in Damascus, sorry, yes, in Damascus. But this is a little bit, I mean, this is 37, 36. What is super interesting is that uh, uh, while uh, you do not have yet um, joint issues of Antony and Cleopatra, at least until uh, 36 BC. For example, what is clear here is that it was evident in the East that Antony and Cleopatra were creating, let's say, a joint venture. And for example, in uh, uh, Amintas, uh, a king of Galatia, which was actually, a, which had been put a client king of Rome, okay, which had been put on the throne by Antony, issued these bronze issues where the, uh, where Artemis uh, here is clearly, as clearly the facial features of Cleopatra. So, if you remember, we have already these examples. Uh, we had already these examples, for example, with Fulvia, or even with uh, Octavia, where the uh, women of Mark Antony, actually the wives of Mark Antony, Cleopatra and Mark Antony are not married at this point, uh, because Antonio, Antony is still married to Octavia. But uh, 
we know that uh, with Fulvia and Octavia, Fulvia and Octavia were put uh, on coinage in order to, at least in the East, uh, in order to uh, provide an homage to Mark Antony. And what is very interesting is that this client king does exactly the same from Cleo for Cleopatra. So of course Cleopatra was, and this is super interesting because of course Cleopatra was already issuing her own coinage as queen. You know, she was in a completely different political situation from the, where, from the one which uh, Fulvia or Octavia were. She was a queen on her own, so she was issuing her own coinage, but at the same time, the client kings of Rome, and especially the kings which were, of course, loyal to Antony, felt the need to, um, to provide an homage to Mark Antony by putting uh, uh, the facial features of uh, uh, Cleopatra uh, on uh, their coins. Even here, she's represented as a goddess. And we saw that this was normal, not to, for, uh, uh, for example, for Fulvia, Fulvia and also uh, Octavia, much more important uh, will be for Livia. They were usually represented as a goddess. But Octavia, um, Oh, okay. Oh, yes. Uh, this one, uh, this one, uh, Susan, this one, as you can read here, is written Basileos Amintu, so of the king Amintas. So it's Greek. So we have some examples of uh, Semitic, uh, Semitic, for example, dating on the coinage of Tyre, of Ascalon, but in general, the coinage universally adopted uh, for this coinage is the Greek, because of course the Ptolemies, uh, uh, the Ptolemies were Hellenistic kings, and also all declined kings of Rome in the East were using, uh, were using uh, mostly Greek, even if we have some example of bilingual uh, uh, of bilingual examples. But anyway, so, oh, sorry. Let me just, I just went on. Okay, so this is one thing. Then you, we have uh, this interesting uh, uh, coin. And once again, thank you very much, <laughs> uh, Mary, uh, for uh, this beautiful uh, image, which is one of the most beautiful I can imagine for these uh, uh, tether drums which were issued uh, uh, in Antioch. Now, uh, RPC has been, once again, the date of issues of RPC has been really debated. Uh, what we know is that there is a gap in the, um, in the tetradrums of Antioch between 37 and 31 BC. And we also know that one of these tetradrums has been, uh, they found a overstrike of one of these tetradrums on a coin of uh, Frate, the fourth of Parsha. So let's say, I mean, I would say that uh, we can put it between, which, was, uh, uh, which has to be dated to 33. So this uh, coinage was issued between 36 and 33. Uh, BC. Now, what is incredibly interesting here, I and mean, there are lots of incredibly interesting elements. First of all, the fact that has been hugely debated which one is the obverse of this coin. So this is issued in a Roman province, in a Roman province, so in theory the sovereign here is Mark Antony. So it should be on the obverse, that's what is usually thought, but this has been, uh, has been debated. But what is very, very interesting, I mean, there's so many interesting elements of interest here. Uh, let's begin, uh, let's begin with the fact that these two, uh, that the two portraits are not put together, they are not jugate. So they are represented, represented both of them, 
and both of them have power on their own and therefore they are put on different faces of the coins. So one is in the obverse and one is on the reverse, then we can discuss, of course, uh, which one is which. But this was, for example, not the way in which Hellenistic uh, royal couples were represented. They were always represented Jugate or otherwise only the king was represented. This is absolutely new. Actually, if you remember the first example of the presentation of a man and a woman on, a differ on the reverse in that case, was presented in Phoenicia again for Antony and Fulvia. So this is, what I'm trying to say is that this is something that it's uh, basically Roman, or at least this has been created, had been created for Antony, okay? So this is nothing, this is, this is absolutely revolutionary. The thing of putting a man and his wife, uh, whatever, his partner, uh, his female partner on different uh, sides of a, of a coin is something new, completely new. Another thing that is new is another element that is super interesting is also the way in which Cleopatra is presented. I mean, you see, and look at also Mark Antony. Mark Antony, I told you about this sort of hyper-realistic, uh, hyper-realistic um, style, Roman style. And this was typical of, for Roman generals, for example. Now you have an also image in Roman portraits it's said, you know, they are always hyper-realistic. They represent these wrinkles. You have these far from perfect faces. But the idea is really actually to enhance the realism and thus the power of those people. Well, you know very well that usually on Hellenistic portraits and also on portraits on coinage, you have a much more uh, standardized, idealized way, okay? This is definitely not present on this portrait of Cleopatra. I mean, for sure Cleopatra had a very long nose or whatever, but here you see that the style adopted for her portrait is perfectly, it's very, it's the same as the one adopted for the portrait of Mark Antony. So these are really two kings, two, sorry, two, um, anyway, two royals in some way, two people who are sovereigns on their own, and they are really represented with this very hyper-realistic style that is related to the Roman. But here, for the first time, Cleopatra appears with uh, her title, which is exactly Thea Neotera. And another thing that is super interesting here, please, is that, um, is that here, Cleopatra, uh, this, this one is written in uh, the use for here, for the title of Cleopatra here, for the legend, they use here the nominative. Now the nominative, so, Instead, the Greeks would always write, uh, write, as we saw for the other coins, of the Queen Cleopatra, of the king here and there. But here, on the contrary, it's written Queen Cleopatra Thea Neotera, so not of. And this is, once again, a very Roman thing to do. So it is written in Greek, yes, but the disposition of the portraits, the style of the portraits, the adoption of the use of nominative on the contrary, is really Roman. And here you have exactly Thea Neotera. Now, usually this has been uh, um, interpreted, Thea Neotera, as, I don't know, Thea, 
Cleopatra, Cleopatra as a goddess, then perhaps as Aphrodite. But then what is new? Because Neotera means new goddess. So Cleopatra, Cleopatra, new goddess. This could be a possibility. I would say that this is what uh, Rolf Strothman um, took in a recent article. He basically rehatched what was Battery's thesis, that actually this is the title of Cleopatra is Cleopatra Thea, the new Cleopatra Thea. Now, who was Cleopatra Thea? We actually talk about Cleopatra Thea at the very beginning, because Cleopatra Thea was this terrible woman <laughs> who, who ruled uh, with uh, two different husbands, then was co-regent uh, with her uh, son, who eventually murdered her because he was scared of her. But Cleopatra Thea, in spite of all the, let's say, the details of her life, was also much more important, a Ptolemaic queen who ruled over the Seleucid. So was a queen born in Egypt who then succeeded in, who then married Seleucid kings. So succeeded then in some way in unifying um, Ptolemies and Seleucids. And this is exactly what is the imperial, let's say, ambition of Cleopatra VII. So it makes perfect sense for her to call herself Cle Cleopatra, the new Cleopatra Thea, because actually in this case, through the help of Rome, she could succeed in unifying then the Hellenistic kingdoms of the Seleucids that by that time and no more kings, they were of course, uh, were made into the province of uh, Roman province of Syria. They had a governor, a Roman governor and the Ptolemies. And you see that you have, for example, in this very nice portrait, uh, this very nice coin from uh, uh, the city of Dora in Phoenicia. On the contrary, you have these Jugate portraits. So what I'm trying, which is uh, really in the Hellenistic way, okay? This is really the Hellenistic way of doing. And uh, what is once again interesting is that usually, and you could see it even from here, I mean, here is special, once again, also Cleopatra Thea was a special woman because uh, she was corrigent, this is her son, so she puts herself uh, in foreground, but usually, as you can imagine, was the king that was in foreground, the male element of the royal couple. And here you see the same. Here you recognize Mark Antony. Cleopatra, of course, is in foreground. But you see that when they deal, when Cleopatra had to deal, uh, on the contrary, Cleopatra and Mark Antony had to deal with a uh, specifically Eastern audience, then they would present themselves as uh, with a visual language which was typical of Ptolemaic kings or Seleucid kings, so the Jugate portraits. While in Antioch, which was of course part of the Roman province of Syria, they were much more careful in presenting themselves in a different way. Uh, let's also not remember that the tetradrums of Antioch were the provincial coinage of Syria, basically. So it was really important for them to adopt, let's say, a uh, Roman compatible. And then we have this important, of course, of course, it's already late. We have this super important uh, um, happening and ceremony, which are the so-called donation of Alexandria, who took place in 34 BC, of course, in Octavian propaganda. This was when Cleopatra uh, gave away, uh, gave away all of the East, uh, all of the Roman East uh, uh, to Egypt. But what I would like on the contrary to, uh, to, to to tell you is that in reality, in reality, um, most of these things, like for example, uh, Media and Partia, had not been conquered by Rome yet. 
So of course she was not give, uh, Anthony was not giving it away to anybody. And Anthony had just conquered Armenia. And Phoenicia, Syria and Cilicia, I mean Cilicia and Phoenicia had already been given to Egypt with the approval of Octavian. So this is another very, very interesting element, okay? So, and another thing is that here it's not, uh, it's not, I mean, I, only, this is only a, um, an excerpt of it, but what uh, was super interesting is that in this donation of Alexandria, which was really not a triumph, because that's what uh, Octavian and his propaganda tried to say, but of course it would have been impossible to celebrate a triumph outside of, uh, um, outside of Rome. But what was interesting in what is this was this Hellenistic celebration uh, where o Cleopatra again was presents herself, presented herself as Aphrodite, Antony as Dionysus, uh, and all their chi other children were dressed in different ways, and I will tell you which one. Antony, the throne of Antony was at the same level as the throne of Cleopatra. And the thrones of all their children, and also of Caesarion, were put at a lower level. Once again, to proclaim the fact that Antony and Cleopatra were sh shared the power, at, were peers, and they were sharing the power together. So, in the donation of Alexandria, uh, donation of Alexandria, uh, Antony, uh, who had recognized of his own the twins, uh, uh, Cleopatra, uh, Selene, and um, uh, and, uh, and uh, Alexander, um, so Cleopatra Selene and Alexander Helios, so Alexander the Sun and Cleopatra the Moon, um, also recognized his youngest son, which was Ptolemy here, and of course was also present Caesarion, which was the son of Caesar. And these are the donation of uh, Alexandria. Once again, please uh, notice uh, that this part had not been conquered by Rome, for example, and these other parts had already been, of course, uh, uh, that given, given to, um, to Egypt, and so uh, also part of Crete, uh, in all of Crete had already been given to Egypt well before Antony. I mean, this was not Antony creation. So, okay. And then we have, uh, and sorry, during the ceremony, uh, the ceremony, Cleopatra, uh, the kids, the kids of Cleopatra, children of Cleopatra and Mark Antony were um, were awarded the title, were bestowed the title of Kings of Kings. Now, Kings of, King, Kings of Kings is the title that was used by the Parthian kings and partly was sometimes used by the Seleucid kings, but which tells you exactly what it's about. Let's remember that Parthian, the Parthian expedition, which of course uh, Antony was not able to um, finish and successfully, was the ultimate the ultimate ambition for Antony, but also, let's remember, for Rome. Yes, uh, for Rome. So what I'm trying to say is that by bestowing to her kids, uh, to her kids, the title of kings of kings, they were basically claiming not something that was already Roman, but were already bestowing on them the title that they hope they would have claimed than from the king of the Parthians. And that's why actually Alexander's, Alexander Helios was dressed as a Parthian king. And here 
you have a denarius, a denarius, and with that I, I know that I will, uh, I have only four, five more slides at least on Cleopatra, but here you see that once again Cleopatra here, there is a silver denarius, and Cleopatra here is presented as Regina Regum, so she is, she is the queen of kings, and the kings are the children of Mark Antony and Cleopatra. And once again, but this is not a diminution, this is really a way for Antony to put himself within all this dynastic uh, strategy, which had been ruling over the East for centuries. Okay, I'll just go on. And by the way, sorry, uh, there is this fantastic, uh, the reason, uh, usually on catalogs and also on Crawford, you, uh, you see Cle uh, Anthony as in the obverse uh, on this denarius. The reason why I put actually Cleopatra is because of this very interesting article, once again, a Julien Olivier of 2014, they found a brocage and this brokerage, since the reverse brokerage are very, very rare, basically, we are basically sure, you can see the face of Cleopatra here, the portrait of Cleopatra and here. So we know that Cleopatra was in the obverse. And once again, we don't have time to discuss the implication of this, but you see. And, uh, and this is an uh, answer to, of course, Anthony at the same time was, uh, uh, I mean, actually, he had the, we have the uh, Armenian campaign of Antony, which was the one actually celebrated in Alexandria. And following the uh, donation of Alexandria, uh, we have this coinage uh, in uh, Cyrenaica. Now, I have to say that there is a forthcoming paper by Michele Azolati, who actually produced um, Die study of this very, very coinage that shows uh, that once again the obverse actually was the one with Cleopatra. So, this once usually it's represented with Antony and the obverse, but in reality it's Cleopatra on the obverse, uh, even here. But once again, this was not like strange in some way, because those were the territories uh, of Cleopatra. And you have Cleopatra and Mark Antony in these other coinages together, and so on, with finishing, of course, Cleopatra in Patras. So here you have, uh, with Cleopatra and Mark Antony, and then I'll show you at least some coins of Cleopatra, you have really not the homage, we, we saw that with Fulvia and uh, Octavia, those women, which were very, very uh, strong women and politically active women on their own, were represented on coinage as, for example, in the case of Octavia, as enabler of the second of a political, a political agreement, which was the second triumvirate, or as a personal homage to Antony. Here with Cleopatra is a completely different thing because she is actually a queen on her own and together with Mark Antony, they devise a strategy, a dynastic strategy, which was taught to unify basically the East under the joint sovereignty of Rome and, uh, and Egypt. One thing, because of course we don't have time now to go unfortunately uh, with Livia, which is very, very sad, but I think that the very important element uh, about uh, Livia is, on the contrary, the fact that in spite of the fact that she is the first Roman empress de facto, she is never represented on coinage um, as Livia by Augustus, and will only be represented as goddess, as goddess. So there are goddesses with the feature, feature features of Livia, even on the coinage of his son, the emperor Tiberius. Only in the east, of course, 
um, Livia is presented uh, is presented on Coinage with her own facial features. So, for example, in this the title slide here, there is no doubt that this is Livia. Okay, these are facial features. Actually, Livia in twenty four A D she's already dead because she dies in in nineteen A D. But she is represented here as Salus Augusta. She's not. Uh, represented as Livia. We have only very few examples under Tiberius, I'll show you in a second now, where there is the name even of Livia Augusta, but she's not represented on coinage. And this is really, a, I would say, a, in order to counterbalance what has been done by Anthony. I'll now uh, stop sharing uh, my screen and I'll show you then some coin, of course, if you have uh, any questions for me, as usual, I went overboard, as usual. Uh, but, uh, um, okay, uh, shall we just switch uh, a moment to coins? Um, so I will begin, um, I will begin with uh, Denarius, the Denarius, uh, I was showing you here the denarius issued uh, in uh, possibly 33, 32. I mean, of course, a debased coinage, uh, debased denarius, which is typical of Mark Antony. But please uh, notice here again this very, very realistic, hyper realistic portrait. And you have here Mark Antony. Uh, then uh, this is, of course, not an example as nice as the one we have uh, we have seen uh, we have seen, uh, for example, on the slide. But this is a tetradrum of Antioch uh, with uh, Antony and Cleopatra. Then. Uh, we have uh, the coinage, I was showing you the coinage of the Cyrenaica, this bronze coinage issued by Mark Antony and Cleopatra. And you can read here Basil Theane, so Basilissa Thea Neo Thea Neotera, so Queen and new goddess, we know that it's not Thea Neotera, sorry, it's new Cleopatra Thea. So this is what is written here. And this is uh, Antonio, Anto, Iupa, Gamma. So, oh, sorry. So Antonios, uh, uh, of course, uh, Iupatos, so consul for the third time. And then I just want to show you some of these outstanding. This is the only representation we have actually. This is super important. This is the only representation we have on the country of Livia, of a portrait of Livia on coinage during the reign of Augustus. I mean, we know that Livia was given enormous visibility, I mean, under Augustus. But that's why her absence of the absence of her portrait from Roman official coinage, Roman imperial coinage, because of course we have several representations of Livia in the provinces, is all the more noticeable. But once again, too noticeable not to think that there was a a clear political intention there. Here, Livia is presented on this coin, which is dated to 13 BC, because in this case, she's presented here with her children. So really, here is Livia as uh, a mother. We know that Livia was granted the Jus trium liberorum, so which was the special exemption 
the special honor that was given, for example, to mother of three kids. In reality, it's pretty interesting because uh, Livia only had two kids. I mean, she had uh, apparently a stillbirth that in general in Rome was not considered as another child. But since uh, she was the wife of Augustus, then she was uh, anyway awarded the exactly this special honor, which was only bestowed to mothers actually of three living children and which was the exemption for guard guardianship. But for example, here specifically uh, for the Augustan propaganda, Livia is presented with her three kids. But other than that, as I said, she is remarkably absent from the Roman imperial coinage, and she is represented, um, she is represented, of course, uh, on the contrary, on coinage of uh, Alexandria, for example, in Egypt. This is clearly Livia, okay? Because as I said, in the provinces, it was evident that Livia was an empress, and so of course she should be put on coinage, but not so much clearly on the, uh, not so much uh, on the, uh, in Rome. In Rome, you have, for example, this one which was issued Imagine after her death, where it's written exactly to Julia Augusta, which was the official title of, uh, um, of Livia. And here it's represented the plaustrum, which was this special uh, chariot, which was um, pulled by two, by two oxen which was the one reserved to vassal virgins, so the most important of the female priestesses in Rome, and to women like Livia and Augustus' sister, Octavia, who were granted the so-called sacrosantitas, which was the fact that they, once again, were exempted for male guardianship, they could represent it on statues. So this is here, once again, this is not a representation, interestingly enough, of Livia, not a portrait of Livia, but on the contrary, a portrait, uh, just something that represents the honors to her. And we know also that her son, Tiberius, tried to carve the honors to Livia. And then I will end here, because of course it's late, uh, with the presentation of this, which is again Livia, in these incredibly beautiful sestertius uh, issued uh, in 22-23 AD, so um, three years or four years after uh, Livia's death, where she is represented as Justitia. Justitia. So the absence of Livia, on the contrary, on coins, where all the other women of Antony were presented on coin, and of course Livia, is never, Livia was the wife of Augustus, but it's very interesting because it's really a different presentation of a different representation of power, a different conception, different idea of power. Here is Livia as Pietas, and of course I'm in the SC because it's as Sturtius, and we end with this one, which is uh, oh oh uh, yeah here. Livia as Salus Augusta, which is very beautiful, which was the beginning of our talk. I'm sorry we went so long, it's two o'clock, but uh, if you have any questions for me, if you're not completely undone, I'm very happy to stay on and answer your questions. No questions? Okay. I have a question. Oh, yes, please. Um, you had shown the brockage that uh, was evidence that the portrait of Cleopatra was the hammer die. Mm -hmm. Or the obverse, I should say. I, I, I meant to say obverse. Die, yeah, yeah, but no, because of course, but because we, we have slightly different languages. But yes, we understand. I understand perfectly what you mean. Yes, Eric. Without the brockage, would it be a total mystery? Or is there any other way to determine it? 
Um, that's very interesting. I mean, there are like usually, I mean, there are some technical issues. Let's say that, for example, uh, most times uh, you determine which one is the obverse uh, when you perform uh, um, a dice study. Yes. Because uh, a dice study, because uh, I know that it's exactly the contrary for uh, modern and contemporary college, but uh, uh, obverse uh, dice are many, are fewer in number than reverse dice. So, for example, the way in which, uh, I don't know, um, Michela Solati has determined that uh, um, the face of Cleopatra was the one on the was the one of the obverse of the coinage of uh, uh, Cyrenaica, the one I showed you with the just with the inscriptions, was just based on the fact that the uh, the dice, the the uh, the obverse, the dice uh, with Cleopatra were fewer in number than the dice of uh, of uh, uh, Cleopatra. So that's usually uh, sorry uh, of Anthony. Sorry, sorry with this. Yes. So usually it's really a count of dice, uh, or unless you have exacting brokerages or other. Mm -hmm. okay. But thank you. It's a great thank question. You. Oh, thank you. Thank you to everybody. So no more questions. OK, then uh, really, thank you very much for listening to me twice uh, in a month. And I'm sorry for Livia, but at least we got to see some coins from Livia. And if you like, I'm very, very um, happy to uh, share with you the PowerPoints of these presentations so that if you have uh, uh, questions for me on slides that I haven't included in my, which I mean that I didn't have time to go over, you can uh, write me questions. I'm very, very happy about, uh, I mean, I, I'm very interested in this topic. Um, so thank you for, I mean, for even following up. So I will have, uh, uh, Austin or Emma distribute, actually ask Austin and Emma, if any of you is interested in having the PowerPoints, please uh, write, uh, uh, write to Austin and Emma and uh, they will share with you the PowerPoint. Yes, perfect, exactly. Membership numismatics.org. So thank you. Thank you for the upcoming Lyceum. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.